Uh, retinue here, Richard Goldberg, Senior Advisor for the Foundation for Defensive Democracies. Richard, thank you for joining us. I know you've been monitoring um, the reports. Uh, what, are you, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And what are your uh, observations, please? Well, the fact that uh, the Israeli media is right now only, if you go to their websites, uh, using American sources, uh, the ABC News report uh, specifically, and the rest you're getting from Twitter, uh, means that the Israeli media is on censored lockdown right now, most likely uh, from uh, military censors due to the sensitive nature of the ongoing unfolding operations. Uh, and so we have uh, the eyewitness reports, which are obviously shaky when you're in the moment of warfare and obviously you're gonna have disinformation from the iranians coming out because they probably don't want us to know exactly what's getting hit and how bad the damage is going to be uh, and of course we don't know exactly yet what in isfahan or in the isfahan area the israelis may be targeting there's a lot of assumptions of the nuclear sites uh, that are in and around isfahan but of course there are missile sites drone sites uh, irgc the revolutionary guard corps command and control centers there as well so we're going to have to be patient here and understand exactly what the Israelis are striking with, uh, what they are hitting. Uh, there may be air aircraft involved. Obviously, they have standoff capabilities uh, with uh, some of the fighter jets that uh, they have acquired from the United States, most particularly the F-35s. Uh, they also have drone capabilities, uh, whether those are being launched out of northern Iraq and the Kurdish areas. We've seen covert operations like that previously or long-range drones uh, flown all the way from Israel. So again, this is going to be about uh, being patient, understanding the scope of the strike, uh, the targets involved, whether this is a first wave or this is going to be the only wave. Obviously, the sun's coming up already in Tehran. So if this is uh, going to be the end of it uh, at daylight or if we're going to see more as the day progresses. It is fascinating what you said about the Israel and the censorship, and it is also fascinating to look at who is who has the story and who doesn't, who's uh, who's going with it and who's not. Um, the New York Times, which is uh, certainly no friend of Israel in all of this, has not yet reported uh, on on this matter. Uh, Walid Ferris, if you could please, for all of us, break it down: who's in charge of Iran? Um, is there, are there competing factions? My sense has been that there are competing factions and, and it, it changes who's actually, you know, has the upper hand, but give us a sense of, of who's running the show and, and what they're going through right now and, and what are the uh, weaknesses, what are the strengths um, in that regime? Well, many things have changed over the past 30, 40 years, but two matters have stayed firm, is that you have two centers of power. The ultimate power, the ideological, theological power, is the one of the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei and before him uh, Khomeini. He has the control of many ministries directly. He commands the IRGC, the Pasdaran, meaning the Revolutionary Guard, who are the nerve center. I call them the SS of uh, the Islamic Republic. But within the Pasdaran, within the, uh, the powers that controls the executive power, but also the economic centers, the banks, they are wings. They are those who call themselves reformists. They're not. They're just a new version of reformists, just to tell the world that they have multiple wings. As we speak right now, this decision by the regime is going to be united because these so-called wings, at the end of the day, if there is a revolution in Iran, and I want to add one, one, one cent to this, everybody in that regime is going to go. There is no half of the regime that will survive, the other half will go. And precisely, I wanted to add this one thing. There are two strategies to deal with the Iran regime. One is to destroy the economic infrastructure so they could feel the pain and then surrender or not surrender or accommodate. The other strategy is to actually hit all centers of the revolutionary guard, every single one of them. If they are destroyed, what may happen is that the population may jump on the ministries, may jump on those centers because the revolutionary guard are the only force with the Basij, the other sub-militia that they have, that is suppressing, that is protecting the regime and suppressing the people. There should be another arm, which is to target this militia, because that could, could give an opportunity for the population. It may, not be, uh, it may not be clean, but at least the population may bring down that regime that way. All right, we have this. Bloomberg is reporting that Israeli officials notified the U.S. earlier today 
that they plan to retaliate in the next 24 to 48 hours. And mm -hmm. uh, we're certainly within that window. That's an interesting report from, from Bloomberg. There was some uh, speculation earlier here that perhaps they weren't given uh, a heads up at all. Uh, General Holt, you know, Israel has a marvelous military, legendary, uh, so effective. And, you know, some of their uh, successes have been, are still studied, the raid on Entebbe, uh, the raid on that nuclear plant in Iraq uh, 40 years ago or so. Um, this is an opportunity, and here's my question. To, will it, does Israel want to demonstrate to the world in a very clear and effective way, remind everybody that we are one of the best militaries in the world, and you would be very foolish to to mess with us. Uh, if anybody needed the reminder, perhaps tonight is that reminder. You know, that's an excellent point. Part of what the Israelis are doing is reestablishing uh, deterrence. Uh, and, and we have not established deterrence. The United States military forces, our presentation of forces, our lackluster effort against the Houthis has not. But the IDF has not missed the beat here. Um, there was a Israeli general I worked with. I used to have logistics responsibility for the United States where Israel was in my portfolio. And I worked extensively on these logistics plans that you see playing out now. An Israeli general and I sat down and we ex explored all of these types of issues. And this was over 10 years ago. Um, and he said, you know, Blaine, if the United States is not standing by us at the time that we need them, we will have to take care of all of our problems because we understand how world opinion will run against us. And if it's an existential war, we will have to fight our way out of it. And I'm, I'm thinking about those words today because when I start to think about what Iranian military leaders are going to be looking at in terms of a counter strike, and I believe there will be one, um, will they be reaching out and solidifying an alliance with Russia and China? What will they do with Hezbollah? What will they do with the Houthis? How will they marshal more force? How will they try to create a, a very complex targeting solution for the Israelis? Um, and then on the Israeli side, does that mean then that you go preemptively against Nasrallah and Hezbollah? Do you hit selected targets in Beirut? Is that the expansion that we're going to see? But again, I, I think we've got nuclear superpowers involved here. Um, you know, China is extremely dependent on that oil that's sitting in Iran right now. And so they've got to be very nervous in Beijing. The Russians now have cruisers that are in the Eastern Med with Kinzhal hypersonics missiles uh, ready to go. And, uh, and what I'm also very surprised about, by now, by now, we should have heard from the White House. By now, we should have uh, a released statement uh, uh, out of Washington. And, and we don't... Schaefer, if we could go back to you um, uh, for a moment. I, I, I want to go back yeah. to Saturday night and that attack on Israel, which, let's face it, was... Uh, I mean, it was spectacular in one sense, and we saw the Iron Dome, and we saw those things happening, but it was incredibly ineffective. Um, and I'm curious as to why it was so ineffective. Was that the best that Iran had? My sense is that's not, and there were other factors that led to that kind of um, provocation or that kind of strike, and that this somehow is kind of part of an extended dance, and everybody seems to know their role. So uh, to that point, uh, Greg, we know that there were a multiple sets of weapons, everything from drones to ballistic missiles. One, uh, Blaine just mentioned the Kinzhal. There's a good possibility that the Iranians fired uh, their version of a hypersonic, and that's something that's being actually investigated now. This was a test. There's no doubt this was a test. Now, why, did, why was it ineffective? Uh, because the Biden administration allowed the Pentagon, if you recall, Greg, just a day before the attack, Commander of Central Command was there. For better or for worse, they put together a coalition of the willing, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, the Saudis, uh, and uh, I think uh, what we have in Iraq, whether the Iraqis wanted to come along or not, they did. And we were able to use uh, AWACS, uh, you're probably familiar with the Air AWACS, it's the Airborne Command Centers with very effective coverage. And it was actually a, a very effective tapestry of uh, this coalition feeding information to the ground systems, uh, the Iron Dome, uh, those systems were being fed by our intelligence. So the good news was, at least in that instance, the Biden administration and our allies, the remnants of the Abraham Accords militarily were on board. So uh, I think that 99% that they got 
was very effective. I said on the network that evening, I felt very confident that they'd knock him down. But this is the thing. Uh, that was $1.1 billion of ordinance. That was the most expensive uh, fireworks show ever in the history of mankind, Greg. <laughs> and uh, it, it, we, you got to consider the, the Iranians did not spend anywhere near that. So at this point, we have to evaluate exactly how what happened, how effective we were. Clearly, it was effective. But there were there were things woven into that by the Iranians trying to figure out, OK, we took the shot directly. Uh, this didn't work. We had to figure out another way to do it. All right, just to recap, and precious few uh, news sources and actually virtually no official person with a name has weighed in on this in America, uh, on the record at least, but uh, ABC News primarily and CBS News uh, and Iranian news sources uh, reporting that a strike has occurred, a fairly large retaliatory strike launched by the Israeli Defense Forces in Israel against Iran, including missiles and drones at um, uh, numerous uh, cities in addition to Isfahan, actually. There are other communities, uh, cities that, are, that have reportedly been struck. Um, but we don't have that. We also have uh, Bloomberg reporting that the Biden administration was given a heads up that something would happen, uh, given a, um, a notification by Israel that a, a strike would be happening against Iran within the next uh, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we have our uh, great uh, contributors, Blaine Holt, Fred Flights, Tony Schaefer, Walid Faris, and Gabrielle Norhana, who has um, amazing sources throughout the region. Uh, Gabrielle, we haven't uh, talked to you in a moment uh, for a few moments. Can you tell us uh, what is on your mind at this point? What I'm hearing from statements from Iranian officials is a lot of obfuscation, a lot of denials. They are claiming that they have shot down uh, several Israeli drones in the country. Um, again, a lot of inflated claims is what I suspect here. Um, and the other thing that we've seen is threats. One was that um, they are going to target Israel's uh, nuclear facilities in exchange. Again, what Iran is going to do is they are going to take the same decisive uh, contemplative process that Israel did the last few days. So they're not going to do a rash uh, immediate response, but you will see a lot of information shaping uh, today, trying to argue that they didn't, that Israel didn't hit anything of any significance, that Iran's military was paramount here and far more superior than it actually was. Again, a lot of insecurity, I think we're gonna see in the, Israel, in the Iranian military establishment um, that Israel was able to penetrate its airspace really quite easily, it seems, um, and doing so in the middle of the night without civilian casualties that we've seen so far. I'm looking for a statement from uh, the Imam Saeed Ali Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader. He has not been on Twitter, although he has an active Twitter account, unlike some prominent conservatives I know, and he's, uh, he's been tweeting up a storm of, over the past, uh, well, for years now, uh, his last tweet is five days ago. Uh, the malicious Zionist regime will be punished. Uh, the words from uh, the supreme leader there in, in Iran. All right. Uh, we kind of went through a, a general recap of what we know and what we are, uh, what we have access to. Fred Flights, uh, we have not checked in with you in a little bit. Please um, uh, share your thoughts. Well, you know, I like to consider what this means for the so-called Russia, China, Iran, North Korea axis. And uh, there is there are some Russian ships in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I talked to some people today who said that maybe Russia would attack Israel if Israel attacked Iran. And I think Iran probably expects Russia and China uh, to come to its aid now. And I don't think they're going to. I don't think either Russia or China we were very happy when Iran launched this reckless attack against Israel. The Russians and the Chinese have trade relations with Israel. They're not, there's not good trade relations with Russia and, and, and Israel right now. I wish they didn't have trade relations with the Chinese. But my guess is that the Russians and the Chinese will press very hard to de-escalate. They're not going to get involved in this fight, and it's going to greatly annoy the Iranians who thought they were a part of a new anti-Western axis. Oh my goodness, I could have told the Iranians that. If they were counting on help from the Chinese or 
uh, the Russians. And I mean, culturally, there's also a major gap, but uh, I guess they at times have uh, interests that are that are common, but uh, no way. Am I? Uh, what do you make of that, uh, please, uh, Richard Goldberg, uh, the idea that Russia and China, it's amazing that Iran may have been counting on them for support. We don't think that's going to happen, right? Uh, well, I think that that's right. I think Fred has that on the nose. Um, I think that uh, they, at least at the moment, the Iranians obviously have gotten what they needed as far as revenue streams from the Chinese technology sharing uh, and nuclear cooperation from the Russians. Uh, but uh, the Russians obviously have their hands full with Ukraine at the moment militarily. Uh, we are seeing some reports coming across uh, from some of the uh, Lebanese outlets and, and other reports. Maybe Hezbollah is now retaliating in some way, uh, launching drones across uh, Israel's northern border. I can't confirm that, but that's uh, the latest I was hearing uh, as, as other guests were talking. Uh, that could actually be an interesting uh, development, uh, meaning if the Iranians, which they have just issued a statement denying any damage, denying any missile strikes on their territory, as Gabriel was talking about, uh, that's now officially come across uh, the transom, uh, are using their proxies to respond to Israel tonight instead of launching a direct missile uh, attack as they did on Saturday night. Uh, that could mean they are opting for a lower level of uh, escalation and response uh, to what they're seeing. Uh, they're obviously not going to tell us what got hit, uh, admit that something got hit, because that would mean their air defenses are porous and that the Israelis can have their way anytime they want. Uh, with F-35s, F-15s, and drone warfare. Uh, and I think that that could be a lot of the message that we're hearing tonight mm -hmm. is we're obviously going to have to wait to see the impact of these strikes, what got hit, uh, what the value of the targets was. I'm not sure that these alone are going to change uh, the calculations of the Ayatollah, impose the kind of serious costs uh, that he deserves after Saturday night's attack. But they certainly send a message, and that is the Israeli Air Force can reach out and yeah, here is one a very uh, well-informed um, observer's kind of reaction to all this. If this is the only attack, then this could be described as very weak, and it's not going to look good for Israel. Iran just fired over 300 missiles at the state of Israel, and they hit an Air Force base with some old 1970s planes. Uh, let's see what happens if there's more to this strike than what meets the eye, but if it's just as limited as what apparently it is, uh, this may not resound well for, for Israel. And it reminds us that the U.S. is putting a lot of pressure on the Israelis not to strike in a, in a particularly strong manner. Uh, Gabrielle Norhana, um, that assessment from one of our trusted confidants here, uh, what do you make of that? You know, one thing that what, that strikes me is that Israel didn't even bother to be cowed by the U.S. and, and European uh, demands effectively for unilateral appeasement. That is wonderful news. Um, they shouldn't care about what a uh, few uh, politicians running for re-election uh, care about their security, which is not much. Uh, Israel took their own security into their own hands, as they ought to have done. Um, Iran has demonstrated that it doesn't have an allies around itself. You know, when, when Iran was attacking Israel, you had a whole coalition of countries shooting down their missiles and their drones. Um, Iran doesn't have that partnership. Like you were talking about earlier, Russia and China aren't coming to their aid. Um, that's not a good alliance structure in this case. Uh, they don't. They simply don't have that capabilities. Um, what are we going to see from this? We're going to see countries like Saudi Arabia, like uh, Iraq and Egypt saying, hey, Israel's got our back against our number one enemy in the region, Iran. They are taking on the head of the snake. Uh, these are good guys to ally with. And so I think this is great news for the Abraham Accords, what we're seeing today. Wow. And uh, if, if we could, a quick hypothetical, if President Trump were in office, and I know he likes to say this, I happen to believe it. I, it, it feels right on a, on a gut level. And polls suggest the Americans intuitively understand that the world would be, we would not be going through this. Um, if we had stronger leadership in the White House, if President Trump were president right now, uh, we would not have seen October 7th. Hence, we would not have seen what we're seeing now. Um, something like 65 percent of Americans believe that Russia would not have invaded Ukraine if President Trump were, in fact, President Trump. Uh, so 
Uh, number one, we, we see polls that suggest that. I feel that way. And if I could bring in uh, perhaps uh, Richard Goldberg, um, you're an academic almost and you have extensive experience. Does, does that hold up? I mean, to me, that's more than a campaign slogan. That's more than, you know, MAGA talk. That, that feels very true to me. And I'm just curious in your circles uh, what folks say about that. Well, you know, I think everything obviously comes back to peace through strength uh, as the key doctrine that we all come back to. Uh, and in a place like the Middle East uh, that responds to actions, not to words, uh, if an actor like Iran is going to lash out in this way, cross a Rubicon, uh, and believe that it can escalate against the United States, against Israel, and not suffer any consequences, then you have completely failed uh, in that basic doctrine. Uh, you have led with weakness and invited conflict. And so now the genie is out of the bottle, and there is a need for a very clear-eyed uh, direction of where we're going to put the genie back in the bottle. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, in just the last few minutes, uh, I've gotten a little bit more uh, of a uh, clear update uh, from several sources uh, in the region. It does not sound like nuclear sites were hit tonight. Uh, it does not sound like uh, there was an intent to escalate uh, by the Israelis. This is meant to demonstrate the capability, uh, deterrence by punishment, deterrence by action inside of Iran. Uh, no civilians were targeted in the strike. Military targets were chosen. Uh, I think we'll learn more about that uh, in the coming hours and days. Uh, but uh, clearly, right now, it's up to the Iranians how they are going to respond to this, if their denial of being attacked and Hezbollah, if that report is accurate as well, being used as the response. It could mean that there will not be further escalation uh, beyond here. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if that is correct, but I'm hearing no nuclear sites targeted by the Israeli Air Force tonight. Thank you for that. And uh, Gabriel Norhana, overall, we know that um, Joe Biden has been nitpicking um, at Benjamin Netanyahu uh, publicly and behind the scenes. Who knows uh, what he's saying, but he's been applying pressure. Um, is Israel immune to that? Uh, you know, does it, do, do they, are they altering their policy, altering strategy, altering tactics based on what the Biden administration is telling them or, or, or trying to force them to do? Look, I don't know if any of you have had a bad boss who yells at you all the time, uh, but if you do, you start paying a lot less attention to them the more they yell, <laughs> and you, start, you stop getting annoyed by it. Uh, I think that's the case with, with Israel there, is they've already gotten lectured, they've already been uh, told things they shouldn't do, um, and they realize that they get, they get yelled at whether they, they do it or not. And so at this point, Israel's deciding, hey, we're going to just do what's in our own security interest. That's great news. Um, I think what Israel's learning is also there's a lot of Americans who stand with Israel, who support them taking their own security into their own hands, whatever that takes, um, and that they can they can do that. They might you know annoy a couple uh, politicians on the left, but the the broad majority of American people support them and certainly will support them against the Islamic Republic of Iran, which has killed uh, over a thousand American soldiers. Uh, and civilians. All right. Now, listen, All right. we're not big fans of CNN around here, but uh, the CNN uh, network is close to the um, to the Biden administration. And uh, we're hearing a couple of things from CNN that Israel assured America, the United States, that they would not be targeting uh, nuclear facilities uh, in Iran. So that is that's rather interesting. We're also hearing that the United States did not green light this attack. We may have been informed. Uh, we have that from Bloomberg, but in no way did we say uh, you're good to go on on this one. So, uh, all right, we are waiting. I guess this is battle, battle damage assessment. And Waleed Ferris, if you could join us, uh, forgive me. Uh, do you happen to know what time it is in Iran right now, in Tehran, the capital? I do not, but I, I expect okay, would be like eight hours, so it's like the Gulf, but I don't have uh, an exact uh, answer for that. And no, that, well, that's fine. And, and anything else? I mean, um, the big talk out of Iran, I mean, they have been sending ominous warnings both to the United States and Israel 
Um, but if you could develop more a little bit that uh, I think actually Norahana, Mr. Gabriel mentioned that they're, they're not feeling terribly secure right now, uh, obviously. Let, let, let me make a comparison for the audience to understand the difference between the Iranian attack, the Iran regime attack, I should say, on Israel and now today um, Israel's uh, re reply. When the regime attacked Israel with all these hundreds of, of missiles and drones, we saw the formation, the de facto formation of a defensive coalition. Despite all the disagreement between the Biden administration and Israel, we were there. The British were there. Jordan, out of nowhere, and that was a big surprise to the, uh, to the Iranian regime, flew its jets and then brought down some, uh, some of these drones, which also is a result of Iranian-backed militia on the borders of Jordan. If you recall, a few weeks ago, they were trying to, to destabilize uh, Jordan, so Jordan joined a de facto alliance. The Saudi jets were ready, probably the UAE as well, and there were many in the Iranian uh, opposition and the diaspora who were like demonstrating along with the pro-Israel supporters. So there was a defensive coalition. The problem was when Israel goes into Iran, because of what the Obama and Biden uh, administrations have done in terms of weakening the Saudis, weakening the UAE, weakening Egypt against the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, ignoring completely the, the Iranian opposition, which is crazy to do because they are their main the main player against the, the regime. And of course, putting all that pressure on the Netanyahu government, on Israel in particular, no one is going to show up there under that pressure. But what Israel has done now, it has demonstrated, as some of you have mentioned, that it can go, it can strike against the, Israel, the Iranian regime, and eventually an Arab coalition, we like it or not, is going to form again as we get closer to our elections, and most likely in 2025, we're going to see it coming back in the Abraham Accord as well. So what's happening today is going to impact not just today, not just the next six months, but next... Of anyone, really, why wouldn't Israel have gone further and destroyed, at least attempted to destroy, Iran's nuclear capacity? We're hearing now from CNN that a promise was made, or not perhaps a promise, but a, a statement was made that Israel would not seek to damage the uh, nuclear capability of Iran in this strike. Why would they make such a um, commitment? Why would that be considered, I mean, why would they do such a thing and why not, why not just uh, make that strike? Mr. Goldberg, if you care to weigh in, please. Well, obviously, the president was applying a lot of pressure on the Israelis not to do something that, in his view, would prompt uh, a major escalation by the Iranian side. Uh, the idea of a year putting forward of some sort of a sustained attack on the nuclear program in Iran, we obviously don't know exactly what the battle plan would look like from an Israeli perspective. It's a little more complicated uh, and unconventional based on the systems and platforms that they have compared to what the United States uh, has in its arsenal and what it would employ in a U.S. strike on Iran's nuclear program. And so uh, from a logistics perspective, a time perspective, a coordination with the United States and other allies, potentially airspace, airspace deconfliction, if that's not being granted, uh, the sustained amount of time such a campaign would take, if it's not going to be a one-and-done type strike, it's not 1981 like the Osirak reactor in Iraq, it's not like uh, the uh, Al-Qabar reactor in Syria in 2007. This is a large program dispersed, uh, some facilities that you have to take a little while at. The air defense capabilities of the Iranians may need to be uh, targeted as well in certain areas. So in that context, and with the president saying, do not escalate, do not do something that's going to further escalate uh, what is already there, and the Israelis saying, we have to do something, Mr. President, we can't let this go completely ignored in the short term while we build potentially even larger responses in the long term, this is apparently where the Israelis settled at, uh, something that the president potentially uh, could tolerate, uh, would provide uh, some political backing for. And we also don't know what else is on the table uh, that the president was offering. Remember, as we talked about throughout the evening, this is a president who has for three years appeased the Islamic Republic of Iran. His entire policy is to throw cash at this regime, hoping it behaves better. 
Uh, all the things that we have seen from October 7th forward over six months, including last Saturday night, are a culmination of his policy. So it is possible that the Israelis said, Mr. President, you don't want us to respond after 120 ballistic missiles just came at a country the size of New Jersey. What are you going to do to change your strategy? What are you going to do to change your policy? Are you going to support the snapback of UN sanctions on Iran? Are you going to cut off the oil flow from Iran to China? Are you going to do anything to meaningfully put pressure on this regime so it's not just us going alone while you say we have to hold back from a military escalation? So we don't know. Are, are there things on the table? Are there things being promised by the president? I don't see the indications of that quite yet. But I think these are all the kinds of conversations that are going on behind the scenes. And remember, just because this is the strike tonight does not mean this is the only strike we will see going forward from the Israelis. Uh, there is a point to be made. Iran's on its highest alert level right now. They're expecting something. Uh, a month from now, two months from now, the people who you might want to target, the places you might want to target, may be a little bit less defended, may be a little bit more unsecure. Uh, so time is really on the Israeli side. They are taking some steps right now to show their intent, to show their capability, but it doesn't mean it's the final chapter. Thank you very much.